Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Whistle Stop and the Vamp Storytelling Showcase! Give it up for your host, So Say We All's newest and healthiest board member, Taylor Funderburg, everybody! What an introduction, healthiest. Well, hello everybody, how are we doing tonight? That's what I like to hear. Well, welcome to November's Vamp Under the Microscope. Like Justin said, my name is Taylor. I currently sit on the So Say We All board and I am thrilled to be this month's producer. I may be biased, but this is an amazing show. How many of you are here for the first time? Yeah. Yeah. Woo! Yay, that's fantastic. Well, So Say We All is all about being a community. The dog, I love the dog, that was great. <laughs> I love that. First dog at Vamp Show, maybe? I don't know. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> all right, so So Say We All is all about being a community, not just for the performers, the volunteers, and the board members that make every event happen, but also with the audience. And we are thrilled to share our experiences with you and have you share your experiences with us if you would like to. I was first introduced to So Say We All during a project for my graduate school. Actually, one of my uh, colleagues is here tonight in the audience, so shout out to him. And I haven't been able to stay away since. When I was asked to join the board, I couldn't say no, and I'm so excited to be here in front of you all tonight. We are firm believers that events like ours make San Diego even a better place to live, and we love hearing stories from our storytellers and hopefully from storytellers like yourself. In the spirit of all of that, at this point in the show, I'd love you to just turn to your neighbor and say hello, give a little wave, introduce yourself if you don't know each other. <laughs> Look at us already building community. That's what I like to see. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight and supporting your friends and family, whether they're storytellers in the show or you just want to come out and... I'm a teacher, I could do this. Do a little... Perfect, thanks guys. <laughs> so thank you again for all coming out to support your friends and family who are in the show or just to hear some local San Diegan storytellers. A few housekeeping items before we dive into the stories. You don't want to see me up here all night. We are at a bar. Shout out to Whistle Stop for hosting us. So big round of applause. And as I'm sure you all are, also we are so excited to be back in person. It's been way too long. So very exciting last couple of months. Make sure to grab yourself a drink if you haven't already um, and tip those amazing bartenders who are helping us out tonight. Since there are so many of us, we encourage you to, when you finish your drink, to pass your empty glass back to the person behind you and so on and so forth. A little uh, fire drill-like, right? We wanna make sure those glasses get clean so that when you get your second drink during intermission, you have clean glasses to do that. So if anyone has a clean, an empty glass right now, you can practice that with your neighbor behind you. I like the front row, they have some determination. <laughs> Look at that, you guys are killing it already. So we encourage you and would love for you to clap and applaud the performers as they finish their pieces. But we also ask that you be respectful during each story and keep your attention on the performers. So this is your official permission to shush your neighbor if you need to, so don't hold back. And also make sure to silence your cell phones. Make sure those ringers are off and that it's all about the performer. All right, and without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to our amazing storytellers. We have Michelle Gehring, Danielle Baldino, Victoria Leva, Ben Kent, Robert Lang, Kate McGovern, and starting us off, we have Ebert Lambert. It all started with a beer and a burrito. A quick lunch before taking an afternoon hike in Hollywood Hills with my son and his dog. I was a little overweight, say 30 pounds tops. My diet had been going to shit for 15 years. I'd gone from the no red meat, low carb diet of my svelte suburban 30s to the occasional mammal-based delicacy and frequent Italian food of my newly single 40s, 
to the Overeater Anonymous and extended cocktail hours of my re-domesticated 50s. I had joined the local gym. I even went a few times. But life had gotten complicated as it does, and the gym schedule devolved into a repeated mantra of maybe next week. I had just survived the slow death of a tech startup where I worked for three and a half years, three of those with a paycheck. I had spent the last four months shuffling around the executive breadlines of LinkedIn before... Is it going to sound like this the whole time? <laughs> I just, uh, I just spent the last four months shuffling around the executive breadlines of LinkedIn before landing a new senior management gig leading a do-or-die engineering project that I was scrambling to convince myself and everyone else that I was capable of doing it. And so, yes, I was a little stressed. Okay, so maybe it didn't start with a beer and a burrito. And as we started our leisurely uphill hike entering Runyon Canyon Park, it became immediately apparent how horribly out of shape I was. Downright sluggish. Stop to catch your breath every few minutes sluggish. My son was patient and said, you could take the easier trail, while the dog just looked at me and said, hey, what the fuck, dude, let's go. <laughs> By the time we crested the first hill, I was feeling a little better, and we finished our walk and went back to his house for cocktails. The next week at work, I was scarfing down a sandwich between meetings when I realized I was late for the next one, which was in the building across the street. So I grabbed my laptop and dashed out into the parking lot, only to be struck by the same heavy chest sluggishness I had experienced on the hike. It felt like I was being squeezed, so I slowly walked. And by the time I had gotten to the other building, yeah, I was fine. But this was not a random thing. My newly adopted chest slug was my latest physical anomaly and was probably bad. So that night, martini in hand, I surfed my way onto WebMD, where you are always three mouse clicks away from diagnosing your terminal illness. I found myself reading about angina. Pretty good symptom match, and that wasn't good. Angina doesn't sound like an Ominous enough, ominous enough word for what it really is. It sounds more like a country and western song or a citrus drink. Nonetheless, the next morning, while late and stuck in aggravating 805 traffic, I called my GP's office and booked an appointment via voicemail. I told the recording I had been having occasional episodes of weird tightness in my chest and thought it might be angina. I have since learned that the onset of angina isn't a casual leave a voicemail message with your doctor kind of thing. The following weekend was Easter Sunday in our traditional Balboa Park picnic with our good friends. During the spontaneous ice chest race back to the car, my chest slug was resurrected once again. Much more pronounced than the previous one, this slug was the slug of slugs. I broke into a walk, wincing, not saying anything to anyone, and I calmly waited for the creature to pass, denying him for a third time. I didn't share what was going on with anybody. Even my wife, Amy, had not been made privy to the appearance of the risen chest slug. The following Wednesday was a good day, for the most part. Amy and I made a nice pasta primavera alfreda that evening, and after dinner, she went upstairs to her office to finish a few things, since it was my turn to clean up and walk the dog, Hazel. But first, I freshened the beverage with a little more bourbon, put on some tunes. I asked Hazel to give me 15 minutes of couch time. I stretched out horizontal. I opened up Twitter to see what moronic thing Trump had said that day, and boom! The chest slug, now weighing approximately the same as the Mazda, was parallel parking on my chest. This one fucking hurt. I sat up and I waited for it to pass. It didn't. It got a little worse, actually. I went outside for some fresh air. The slug squeezed a little harder. Hazel looked at me kind of worried. 
Then I remembered the nugget I had learned from somewhere, I don't know where, about plain aspirin being a good thing for heart attacks. And I just so happened to have a CVS aspirin bottle that had been rolling around in my glove compartment for as long as I could remember. So I fetched it. And I tapped out five and went back inside and washed them down with the latest diluted whiskey, with the last of the diluted whiskey before laying back down on the couch. And this slug was here to stay. And it was angry. Finally, I yelled up to Amy, Hey, could you come down here for a second? To which she answered, Hold on a minute. To which I replied a tad more emphatically, Actually, I need you to come down right now. Thumping down the stairs, she says, What's the rust? What's the rust? Are you having a heart attack or something? She actually said this. By the time she walked into the living room and saw me sprawled out on the couch looking like hammered shit, she knew. At this point of the story, Amy's version diverges considerably from mine, but I'll tell you mine. <laughs> I need to go to urgent care, I said. No, you need to go to the emergency room. Really? Yes, get in the car, let's go. Once in the car, the slug and I agreed that the emergency room was the right place to go. But he hopped out somewhere in North Park for a bit, but came back strong when I was walking back into the hospital. Amy went to the check to check in at the triage nurse desk while the slug and I found a waiting room chair to slump into. I never got her name, but the head triage nurse was Vintage Hillcrest. Early 40s, tats, piercing, bandana-like headband and short curly hair. She was carrying on three different patient conversations in front of her, directing other staff members behind her, filling out paperwork all at the same time. Nurse Kick-Ass ran the whole fucking place and everyone knew it. She looked at Amy who pointed at me and the slug in the chair and before starting to say whatever it was she was going to say, Nurse Kickass went into overdrive and called to the nurse to get me in a wheelchair and take me back for an EKG stat. I don't know if she really said stat, but I used to watch ER on TV. <laughs> the slug wandered off and decided not to follow me into the EKG room, so my assigned nurse and I made small talk while he stuck 12 adhesive pads on various locations across my upper torso connecting a wire to each one. He twiddled some knobs, typed on what looked like a Windows 98 computer, made me a wristband, pushed a button, made a strip of paper emerge from the printer, and then he disconnected all my wires and left the sticky pads in place in case I would need another test. EKG guy then wheeled me back to nurse kick-ass and handed her the paper saying, yeah, the EKG looked normal. She snatched the paper from him and took a look. Something's not right. Something's not right. I don't believe it. Take him to A4 and have one of the ER techs there rerun the EKG. He looked at her, about to say something, and she said, now! It was definitely not stat that time. What was the guy going to do? She ran the whole fucking place. So off we rolled to A4 in the actual ER with gurneys and EMTs and ambulance drivers hustling around with... Occasional crackling of radio transmission. Amy came with. She was still filling out paperwork, and the ER people were bound to have more questions. Plus, she hates to miss any of the good stuff. The chest slug, he was nowhere to be found. EKG guy helped me onto the exam table, gave me a hospital gown and a bag to put my clothes in, then wheeled the empty chair away. A calm PA comes in to tell us what's going on. And that we're going to keep me here for a few hours for observation. She gave me a shot to relax and started to ask a lot of questions. That's when nurse number three arrived, wheeling in her EKG cart. 20-something, long blonde hair, ponytail, tough, athletic. She definitely played competitive softball at some point <laughs> in her life. Friendly, but all business. She started to attach her bundle of 12 wires to the corresponding sticky pads on my body, but then stopped and looked puzzled. Who hooked you up to your, for your EKG? 
they're totally not placed right. The guy that wheeled me in here. I felt kind of bad narking on the EKG guy, <laughs> knowing that he would eventually be subjected to the wrath of nurse kick-ass. But so be it. This is how it would have happened on ER. <laughs> nurse softball ripped off all of the sticky pads and put on new ones in a different torso arrangement and reran my EKG. I was trying to provide calm PA the details of the last few hours and days, but the drugs were kicking in, and I was starting to feel pretty out of it. My chest was still tight. My breathing hurt a little bit. But I was happy the evil little chest slug appeared to be chemically subdued. The EKG spit out a new paper strip. And within 30 seconds, the casual exam room vibe exploded. Inverse doctor no joke. Intense <laughs> and a little worked up. Behind him, Nurse 4 rushed in with her push cart of various hospital supplies and an IV tree. Mr. Lambert, we have a cardiac team on the way and we will be prepping you for surgery. They should be here within 30 minutes. Has something changed, says Amy? <laughs> yes, he's having an MI right now. What's an MI? I ask. I clearly had not watched enough ER. <laughs> Mr. Lambert, you're having a heart attack. He started prodding me with his stethoscope. Are you currently on any medication? Have you taken any medication in the last 12 hours? I took five aspirin when this all started about an hour or so ago. You're lucky you did. That very well may have saved your life. My spontaneous and rash decisions have never paid off this well before. <laughs> The calm PA quickly exited with Dr. No Joke, who was last seen giving EKG dude a stern talking to in the open area outside of A4. Nurse Softball and nurse number four whipped me into surgical ready shape and rolled me onto the gurney. As we wheeled out into the corridor, we passed Nurse Kickass coming out of a door zipping past us. See, I told you. I knew something was going on, but you'll be okay now, she said. And I said, you're right, you were right, thank you. <laughs> but she quickly disappeared through another door, no doubt diving back into her triage melee. I really wish I'd gotten her name. I think she may have been much more of a lifesaver than the five aspirin. We wheeled onward through the empty and dimly lit late night corridors of Mercy Hospital. Amy clung to her sense of humor and asked if this is where the ho organ harvesting was done. <laughs> Which cracked up softball and nurse number four. Amy was doing great until they sat her in the tiny surgical waiting room on the fifth floor by herself for two hours a little after midnight. That part's in her version of the story. The surgical team, well, they operated like a surgical team. Flipping me from gurney to operating table, wrapping me in sheeps, ripping open packages, wielding buzzing shavers, inserting an IV valve into my arm, and then whoomp, putting on my mask, general anesthesia, 99, 98, 97. My doctor says this sort of heart disease is often hereditary, but of course greatly exacerbated by letting your health go to shit. My father had a quadruple bypass when he was 67. He was always in pretty decent shape most of his life. His rebuilt heart lasted him another 25 years until it finally gave out a few months ago at 92. For his bypass, they cracked open his chest as they did back in the 90s. For me, I got two stents placed in my, the main arteries of the left ventricle of my heart, which they somehow inserted through my inner upper thigh. The two arteries were completely clogged. We kept the before and after copies of the x-ray on the fridge at home for months to encourage my post-op diet. <laughs> I am back to the no red meat, low carbs and dairy diet, some chicken, lots of fish, lots of fresh veggies. My cardiologist shared this little diet adage, the fewer the feet, the healthier the meat. <laughs> 
Of course, Amy caught him flat-footed for a response when she asked him about octopus. <laughs> I became pretty good about going to the gym again two or three times a week until the year of COVID-19, which helped me get, gave, gain back my COVID-20. But I'm working on getting back to the gym, you know, maybe next week. Oh, and I gave up whiskey, sort of. I have cut way back on drinking, sticking primarily to clear liquor and red wine. <laughs> They'll say you live longer if you don't drink, but I'm skeptical. <laughs> I don't think you live longer. I just think it seems a lot longer. <laughs> I check in with my doctor every six months, and I take a handful of prescription drugs every night and over-the-counter supplements every day. I have a Fitbit that's constantly telling me how fucked up I am. <laughs> I'm doing okay. I'm feeling fine. But when I woke up in the recovery room in the hospital that next day, I couldn't believe how empty my chest felt for the first time in months. How easy it was to breathe again. How much energy I had and how lucky I felt. Some of that may have been the good drugs. But that slug was definitely gone. He's been gone for nearly four years, and I hope I never see him again. Thank you. That was the unkillable Eber Lambert, ladies and gentlemen. Radiation treatment. I knew this day was coming ever since that phone call three months ago when I was diagnosed with stage one breast cancer, but I haven't let myself think about it. Now it's the first day of treatment, and I have to think about it. Fifteen two-minute sessions. Cosmetically, those 30 minutes of zapping shouldn't change anything. Their medical benefit may never be known. I understand radiation as a kind of mopping up operation to catch any stray cells that may have wandered outside the 0.6 centimeter lump itself. The side effects are supposed to be minimal, though I'm told I'll be tired by the end of the third week. But it is cancer treatment. Radiation is an investment in my future self, the cancer-free 60-year-old, 80-year-old I plan to be. I've always been a late bloomer. I feel younger and less experienced than my years. For decades now, when I'm asked my age, people always say I seem 10 years younger. Inside, I feel even younger than that, like a child in grown-up shoes playing an adult from a script. I blame it on my risk-averse, cautious nature and on some big life transitions. I grew up on a Kansas farm, a member of a tiny Mennonite community. As a young adult, I left that community, I changed my religion, and I transitioned to city life. I still feel like I'm new here. So this cancer diagnosis, the possibility that death might be nearby, maybe just down the street, when I'm finally figuring out how to live, seems ludicrous. I just can't get my head around it. I decide to take a shower before my afternoon appointment. Since the pandemic, I've reduced my shower schedule to occasional, and I just showered the night before but I will be getting naked for strangers. Then, having invested in a shower, I spend some time choosing my outfit, white capris and a vintage Hawaiian shirt, floral in orange and hot pink with strappy sandals. I add a necklace and some earrings and some rhubarb-colored lipstick, 
and I fairly bounce out the door. My neighbor notices as I trot out to the car and asks if I'm going someplace special. Radiation, I sing out. His smile tilts for a moment, but then he laughs and says, the good thing is that now you have an excuse to smoke as much weed as you want. <laughs> I laugh along, but truly life is challenging enough with my head clear. I've never been to the building where I'm going to be zapped. With my poor spatial skills, GPS is a God-given miracle. Soon I swing into the unfamiliar Cancer Center parking structure. I park in the tiny space without hitting anything. I note the stall number so I can enter it to pay for parking. Then I patiently coax the machine to spit out the parking pass, figure out where to exit the parking structure, cross the street to the proper entrance, where I see lanes for staff and patients. I need so many adulting skills just to get to the door. I stand on my six-foot distancing dot and move up precisely one dot at a time. I solemnly answer questions through my mask about symptoms and possible COVID contact. I affix my visitor badge above my left breast, the healthy one, and enter the breezy building to check in yet again in radiology. I sit on the edge of a seat in the waiting room as far from others as possible and exhale. Then I look around. The bright lights, shining surfaces, uncomfortable chairs, and chemical smell of cleaners make my hands sweat. One young woman with a puffy face and pale lips is leaning back, eyes closed. An older, thin woman with a head wrap is wheeled in. I don't belong here. It's a mistake or a mix-up. They already took the lump out. There, were no, there was no cancer in my lymph nodes. I'm cancer-free, right? And I was told I have the best kind of cancer you can get. Highly treatable, detected early. I'm not really sick like these other people. I look perfectly healthy and I feel fine. Maybe they should stop fussing over me and save their radiation for somebody who really needs it. Some approximation of my name stutters from the nurse's mouth. She shows me to the undressing room. I should strip from the waist up, take off my shoes, put on the gown with the ties in the back, bring all my things out with me in this bag, and have a seat over here and wait to be called again. This is about as far as my short-term memory can extend, five steps to carry out. I manage them. Then I perch on the seat so my half-covered back doesn't touch the icy chair. The gown is ugly, blue, and king-sized. It should say, one size fits someone. The hair is standing up on my pale, skinny arms. Why is this waiting room refrigerated? A smiling, robust young man appears to collect me. I jerk from my juvenile self. I feel ridiculously old now slow and senile next to him. David is his name, and we step into the wind and sea room for my treatment. The other radiation room is named for a beach also. Inside, I do an eye roll. Yeah, radiation is a day at the beach. At first glance, it's hard to imagine how it could be less like a beach. It's cold and dark and full of gunmetal gray machines suspended from the ceiling. A sheet-covered, narrow platform under a dim spotlight, occupies the center of the room. But there are some similarities, I muse. Parking's a bitch. There are strangers everywhere. There's a lot of flesh on display. I will lie down and position myself to ensure optimal exposure. And I'll leave with a sunburn on my pale breast. We're joined by David's colleague, even younger, James. They radiate healthy youth and are so handsome and solicitous. They situate me on the hard table. I'll become a pro at this, but today everything is awkward. The gown is so huge, I can't help sitting on it. I have to stand again to get it out from under my butt. 
what is the point of all this modesty when I'm just going to strip in a minute anyway? James says that as they position me, my job is to be a bag of cement and not try to help. They pull me up toward the top of the platform, then an inch to the right. They slip my arms out of the gown and over my head into brackets. They readjust my right shoulder. I'm a life-size doll. I smirk internally. If they pulled the string in the middle of my back, would I pipe, my name is Michelle. I have cancer. Do you like my gown? <laughs> Instead, they pull out what looks like a six-inch sewing ruler. This seems suspiciously low-tech. They're measuring, lining up the tiny pinprick tattoos they bestowed on me a couple of weeks ago. Then they're calling out numbers to each other. We have Pandora, says David. What would you like to hear? So I say, oh, Stevie Wonder, please. And I get signed, sealed, delivered, which makes me grin. I think that I will ask for someone different each day. Tomorrow, Aretha Franklin. Wednesday, Bonnie Raitt. My brain rattles on. I hope I don't embarrass these 20-somethings or myself with my musical choices. What if they don't know who I'm talking about? What if they think my favorites are for old people, hopelessly lame? The moment has arrived. They leave to avoid exposure. I'm alone. Grinding sounds and green laser light stream from the metal and glass contraption above me. Isn't this stuff dangerous long term? I'm being poisoned, right? Irradiated. But I feel nothing except stiff from lying motionless. The machine shuts down, silence. They come back in a moment later. The table bumps sideways a few notches and they move the machine above me and efficiently snap on an attachment. It's close to me, almost touching my bare breast. They leave the room again. The machine hums as Michael Jackson pleads, give me one more chance. I watch my chest pulse up and down. My valiant heart keeps beating, doing what it does, what it's always done, whether I'm grateful or not. I've not been grateful enough. My doctor says the x-rays won't be close enough to, to my heart to hurt it, that it feels exposed and vulnerable anyway. I breathe an apology to my heart right there at the core of me all the time, and I just ignore it. David and James come back in and cover me matter-of-factly. They lower the table and ask if I'd like a hand, but I rise unaided and go to find my clothes. With clammy hands, I stuff the huge gown deep into the laundry bin and step into the light of the atrium, sandals clicking on the shiny tile. Freed. I step out of the building into the heat and natural air. I cross to the parking structure and my familiar car. I take off the mask. I sterilize my hands. Now I know how to get out of here without the GPS. I sing loudly along with Lenny Kravitz's Are You Gonna Go My Way on the way home. I dance in my seat at the stoplights. I do not look at the drivers next to me. In the house, I spread the thick desitin-like steroid cream on my breast. It feels soothing after the assault. There, there. I vow to myself, I will shower and wear my favorite shirts and the lipstick under my mask and my best earrings too each day till this chapter is over. I glance up in the bathroom mirror. The fingers of my left hand rest on my scarred breast. My palm cups my faithful, steady heart. That was the fashionable Michelle Gary. When I took the Navy oath of office in 2011, I was swearing to defend our country and constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic. Little did I know that my time in the military would have me fighting my own enemies over and over again and that the battlefield would be my body and my appearance. 
early on in officer development school, one of my first few weeks as an officer in the Navy, we were all gathered around our chief for some sort of motivational pep talk, sitting like ducklings as he stood in the center of us. People were sitting in all sorts of ways, cross-legged, kneeling, flat on the floor. I sat in the way most comfortable for me, which was a low kneel, the back of my thighs against my calves, hands in my lap. I was listening intently, steeping in the pride I'd often felt during training, excited to finally start my career. When the chief suddenly stopped mid-sentence, looked straight at me, and with a disgust I'd never heard before and haven't heard since, told me to stop sitting like that. I was dumbfounded, and to this day, I have no idea what was so offensive about my position. I swallowed hard, my cheeks burned hot, Tears welled up behind my eyes, and I racked my brain and cursed my parents for never teaching me how to sit like a lady, which is what it seemed this man wanted. Suddenly forgetting how to manipulate my body and questioning everything I'd ever learned about human legs, I awkwardly scooted my calves out from under me and off to the side, now looking like a mermaid perched on a rock. I felt like an amoeba, disconnected from my body a blob rolling through space and time. How was this position any different or better? My hips ached and my feet fell asleep, but I stayed put this way until the end of this talk. This would become a theme in my career. Alongside nearly every major accomplishment or proud moment, there's also a cringeworthy or embarrassing criticism riding shotgun. My first duty station was Naval Hospital Camp Lejeune, and with this awkward situation behind me, I thrived. I was elected as junior officer of the quarter in 2013. I was vice president of the wardroom, a social club of sorts for officers, a big job for such a junior officer. I took pride in my work both as a nurse and as a functioning member of the Navy, especially my role in the wardroom. However, despite all my accomplishments, as it turns out, my bun wasn't up to par. I was pulled into a supervisor's office while she and another officer struggled to help put my hair into an acceptable bun. I apologized over and over, letting her know I had just gotten my hair cut into layers. Layers, she exclaimed. That is the worst possible thing you could do to your hair if you want a good bun. You may as well cut it all off. And so I did. Navy Uniform Regulations Chapter 2, Regulation 2201, Section 2, Article 22, 01.1 states that <laughs> all buns and ponytails will be positioned on the back of the head to ensure the proper wearing of all headgear. Hair length, when in uniform, may touch but not fall below a horizontal line level with the lower edge of the back of the collar. So I got the hair thing squared away and I figured it would be smooth sailing from there. About halfway through my time at this hospital, a new commanding officer arrived. He was just as motivated as I was and very involved in the wardroom affairs. At one point, he volunteered to shave his head if the wardroom raised a certain amount of money for a fundraiser that I had helped to coordinate. On the day his head was to be shaved, we all gathered in the lobby of the hospital. The crowd included most of the higher-ups and even the CO's wife. The CO made a speech thanking me for all of my efforts and saying how proud he was of me, being such a junior officer yet so committed to the wardroom. At this point, I was coordinating most major events, I had emceed our annual Christmas party, and I was arranging for the hail and farewell of all incoming and outgoing medical officers, and this was in addition to my regular duties, you know, as a nurse. I was beaming with pride. Public recognition is supposed to feel good, right? As the razor touched down on his soon-to-be bald head, his wife leaned in and half-jokingly whispered to me, he would only do this for you. That touching moment quickly turned disastrous. That comment bastardized into something menacing and bordering on pornographic. Within weeks, gossip rippled through the hospital. I was eventually called into my boss's boss's office. It was a busy day for me. We had our dining out that evening, which is an extended dinner event for officers and their spouses, with skits to be performed and innumerable traditions to be upheld and I had been helping to plan this thing for months. So the boss boss sat me down and asked me point blank, 
Have you ever been to the CO's house? My heart sank into my butt. No, absolutely not. I don't even know where he lives, but I could tell he didn't believe me. Well, there are rumors that you go to his house for dinner and that you call him by a special nickname. I wanted to throw up. It was such a bald-faced lie, and I could not even come up with the words to fight against it. This was also just a few months before I was set to leave the station, and the idea that I would be going out on this note devastated me. He continued, look, I don't know what's going on, but you aren't to speak to the CO anymore. It's for his own good. He's up for rear admiral, and we all know what happened with... He didn't need to say it, even though he did. Our previous captain was under scrutiny for allegations that he sexually assaulted an intoxicated colleague at an event the year prior, and it was seriously messing with his chances for promotion. Nobody wanted the same for this captain, so the young, cute, bright-eyed junior officer had to go. She had to get stuffed away. One man's mistake was somehow becoming my punishment. That night, after months of being a good girl and doing everything I was supposed to as an officer, sitting the right way and perfecting my hairstyle, I went into that event with a fuck everything mentality. I got hammered on grog, which is served from a toilet bowl, long story, Navy things. (laughs) When it was my time to speak, I don't remember what I said, but I do know it was dripping in sarcasm and carried by excessive eye rolls. Ultimately, I had to be carried out of the place, angering my closest friends who I had forced to bear witness to this hours long self-destruction. I left this command unceremoniously and with a chip on my shoulder. My first two years here at Balboa Hospital were relatively uneventful, and I actually found myself relishing in this larger hospital. It offered a sea of mediocre officers that I could blend in with. In my second year at this station, I was deployed on the USNS Mercy. To all of you, the Mercy might be known for its good deeds and international support, but for us, it's affectionately called the love boat. In other words, it was another small command. <laughs> it was another small command where gossip ran high. This deployment took us back to basics. Morning quarters, which was a daily meeting to review the plan of the day, was at 7 a.m. sharp. At this meeting, we recited the Sailor's Creed. As I did so, I was promising that I would represent the fighting spirit of the Navy that I would defend freedom, and that I was committed to the fair treatment of all. The only freedom I found myself defending on this deployment was the freedom to simply be in my body as it was. I had a division officer or manager who was particularly irked by any stylistic choices a woman made that even slightly set her apart from the rest of the crowd, whether or not they were in regulations. Almost immediately, this man had a bone to pick with a small lock of hair that fell just to the side of my eyes. The hair regulations in Article 2201.1 stated simply that when bangs are worn, they will not extend below the eyebrows. This man would routinely make eye contact with me and dramatically brush back imaginary hair from his eyes to remind me how much it bothered him. Eventually, he asked me, can't you just pin it back? So I did. I pinned back my bangs and I pinned back my words. I was determined to make this deployment a pleasant one. But he also hated my choice of glasses. Yes, those things I need to see, and of which there are limited quantities when you are literally on a ship in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Article 2101.1 Section D states that, When in uniform, prescription glasses will be conservative and not present a uniform distraction. Authorized frame colors include silver, gray, black, navy, blue, brown, gold, clear, or translucent. Frame colors may also consist of a combination of two authorized colors to include framing that holds the lens in place. Lens will be clear. Maybe he found my glasses a uniform distraction. However, they weren't much different from the standard issue glasses handed out in boot camp affectionately known as BCGs, or birth control glasses. (laughs) One day, I showed up to the unit with my contacts in, rather than glasses, and was met with a sigh of relief and praise from him that, your face looks much better that way. On the same deployment, there was a day where we were welcoming a prestigious guest on board from one of the countries we were visiting. 
I was selected as one of a few sailors to put on our summer whites and stand at attention, flanking the entrance to the ship to welcome this person. As we were lined up, I made eye contact with an older, slightly higher ranking male officer across from me. He subtly motioned to his fingernails, then pointed to mine. He was pointing out my nude colored fingernail polish. I shook my head politely as in, not now, bro. Afterward, the wind again sucked out of my sails in what should have been a proud moment, I caught up with that officer to remind him of the regulations of Article 2201.5. The tips of the nails may be round, almond, oval, or square in shape. Nail polish may be worn, but color shall be conservative. French and American manicures, white and off-white tips with neutral base color only, are authorized. It turned out that he thought women could not have nail polish at all, and instead of just verifying this himself or speaking to me privately, he chose instead to question my professionalism in front of our colleagues. Once again, one man's mistake was my source of humiliation. Further into this deployment, I again found myself called into my boss's boss's office. This time, a fellow female officer was doing the bidding. She told me that I was doing a great job, so much so that I was in the running for another Officer of the Quarter nomination. If only I could get my appearance in check. My whole body felt like it was engulfed in flames. I knew exactly who this was coming from and who put her up to this. It was the bangs hater. I steeled my gaze, steadied myself, and asked her, what exactly, ma'am, would you change about my appearance? Well, you know, maybe your hair to start. She gestured in the general direction of my head without really looking at it. My hair, which had been bobby pinned into oblivion at this point, Mind you, this woman, rather than wearing her hair in the regulation bun, was currently wearing a claw clip, which isn't allowable by any modern beauty standards, navy or otherwise. <laughs> the irony of that moment was not lost on me. What hurt the most about this interaction was that not only was I again being at once praised for my performance, yet admonished for my appearance, but that this time it was by a fellow woman. I left the Navy in 2017 and have been asked many times if I miss it, if I would ever go back, and why I didn't join the reserves. It was always hard to explain my decision to get out and stay out. It wasn't that I got into trouble, there wasn't any kind of traumatic event, and I was never forced to do anything I didn't want to do. However, after a few years removed from it, I realize now that it was the subtle control over my every action, how every seemingly menial decision I made right down to how I dressed myself that morning, had me anxious and second guessing. Energy that should have been directed toward pride or excitement or preparation was wasted on worrying about how I looked. Would this nail polish color outshine my latest award? Would the extra centimeter on the length of my hair eclipse any public accolades I received? Can you tell I have a body under this uniform? While some people leave the military and immediately protest by growing foot-long beards or dyeing their hair hot pink, I just shifted quietly into civilian life. I let myself enjoy just being a nurse, a partner, a daughter, without ever having to worry about how my appearance might play a part in people's perception of my success in those roles. At first, I struggled with what to wear to work. I invested in 10 of the same plain long sleeve t-shirt and seven pairs of identical scrub pants. It took some time to feel okay with not wearing my hair in a bun and months to finally wear it down. The first time I wore my most comfortable Vans to work and no one seemed to judge my work ethic by the decision, it felt like I won the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> Hell, even the first time I got yelled at for actually fucking up at my job felt amazing because I was finally being judged by my actual performance and not the way I looked. I finally tiptoed gently into a comfortable, easy space, free to be me without regulation, transforming my life from a narrow catwalk to a big, comfy couch that I can sink into. I'm finally at ease in my own skin, and that's the only regulation I'll hold myself to. That's officer on deck, Danielle Baldino.
When I was a kid, I always thought it was normal for everyone to wonder when the world was going to explode. My brother informed me at the age of nine that would happen in a couple billion years, yet I immediately felt myself age. I felt like I looked at everything in their most minute details and every single thing was bumming me the fuck out. When I was six, my mother told me that time moved forward and I could never get a single second back until the time I died. I could not sleep for three days after that. I asked everyone at my church what they thought about death like some haunted Victorian child. <laughs> no, hello, can I ask you a question? Just straight to the point of, when do you think you will die? <laughs> and did you know that time won't stop for anyone? <laughs> Growing up, my depression grew and I developed a fun offshoot of debilitating anxiety. I didn't know how to cope with it. I craved some semblance of peace, but was at a loss for how to get it. It should have been a hint that something was brewing when I had a panic attack in fourth grade while reading a book about cannibals. <laughs> Who let me read that book is still a mystery, but apparently the Donner Party really piqued my interest. <laughs> I ran outside the classroom and felt like I, was, like I couldn't breathe. I woke up the next day and felt every single part of my body in excruciating detail. I was aware of my stomach churning, how fast my heart beat, the way my chest felt tight, and how fast my leg bounced under my desk. It was the t first time I noticed any of these things, and that awareness hasn't stopped even until this day especially right now. <laughs> These noticing should have been, well, noticed by my loving family, but they weren't. I was in a household that scrutinized the wrong things. Little hints showed up sporadically. My insistence of buying the book, The Death in Grand Canyon, while visiting the Grand Canyon South Rim should have been a red flag. <laughs> The back cover featured a picture of a dozen poor souls on a raft flipping into the white waters of the Colorado River while a horrified onlooker was frozen in time. I studied it and imagined what it felt like to be that close to death. Yup, that was kind of a fucking hint. When things really started ramping up, I used to stay up all night and absolutely bathe in the silence of my surroundings. Finally, just the quiet peace that I had been looking for since fourth grade. Daytime was filled with constant clutter of sensory overload. Cars screaming by, children coughing with their mouths open, the heat making me flush, and feeling like people want something from me, if not everything from me all the time. I had demands from my family who were pretty critical of me, even from a young age, and that only fueled the fire. However, the times I felt most alive were at night. I felt nocturnal, like some godforsaken curse turned me into a raccoon from being a human, stealthily sneaking through the night with little weird hands and a bandit's mask. Instead, I was a human, exhausted with my own set of dark circles around my eyes that were not nearly as cute. I would sniff industrial-sized Sharpies, looking for some kind of bizarre high a 13-year-old could get, and then wander with a pounding headache to the soccer fields near my home. I would lay in the wet grass at 4 a.m. in my pajamas and stare up at the sky and cry, because the sadness, the sadness that consumed me all the time was overwhelming. I honestly probably scared the shit out of the people who drove past. Seeing some ghostly <laughs> Seeing some ghostly looking apparition staggering towards the darkness. It's a shock no one ever called the cops on the freakishly tall child walking barefoot in the street under the cloak of nighttime. As I went through high school, I made friends who were similarly depressed and awkward, but whom I loved fiercely. I didn't realize anything was abnormal. As I got closer to graduating high school, my friend group changed because I felt that my connection to them had dissipated. I came into a new friend group excitedly because I felt that they truly understood me, but then I began to become more erratic. I would drive recklessly fast on the long roads near my house and close my eyes and count to 10 before opening them back up. I managed to drive from a bonfire on Coronado Beach with four friends in tow to the front of my house in East Chula Vista in exactly 14 minutes. <laughs> I know. <laughs> of course, by the time I stopped, the car smelled like it was burning, and I had to essentially pry my traumatized friends from their seats, but I fucking did it. 
friends slowly faded into the background because they grew scared of me. As I got closer to leaving school and going to university, I was heavily scrutinized for my grades, extracurriculars, and appearance by family, but no one said anything to me about my increasingly erratic behaviors that worried them. I wish someone had. I went to a university hours away from my confining household. I began to make a game out of how long I could go without resting. Minutes raced by, hours ticked on, days blend together. I wouldn't sleep for days, but I would be able to write a six-page art analysis paper in 50 minutes before it was due. I didn't have a name for the last, for my fast thinking, but that felt like it was compressing my head smaller and smaller while the thoughts seemed to go faster and faster with no relief in sight. I didn't know what to call what was happening, but a psychiatrist sure as hell did. While at home on winter break from school, I was diagnosed with type one rapid cycling bipolar disorder with a healthy portion of generalized anxiety disorder to really sweeten the deal. I was numb when I heard the psychiatrist explain that I had been experiencing mania and that without immediate intervention, I was headed for a major depressive episode. I figured I lived being sad all my life. What would be new about this upcoming episode? I was about to learn me some new shit. <laughs> I went back to my university and everything began to melt. I could no longer endure the days. I stopped attending classes, seeing friends, going to the dining hall. Instead, I only existed at night. I had no roommate in the dorms because she had moved out, so there was no one to check on me. Sometimes I would sit in the hallways of my dorm floor, feeling invisible, watching the sun rise through the windows, signaling my time to return to my coffin, and sleep until the cool night air was filling the sky. I ended up medically withdrawing from school and returning home to San Diego with my head hung low. Initially resistant to medication, with a little arm twisting from the same psychiatrist who diagnosed me, he insisted that I take something to help me sleep at night. At that point, I felt so berated and weak, I accepted defeat and promised him I would try to sleep earlier to get some stability. I walked into the pharmacy immediately after our appointment. I thrust my prescription into the pharmacist's hand, having no idea what the psych had written. It looked like more of a note from the Zodiac killer than a doctor, but the pharmacist was able to read it, and that's all that mattered. I was handed a white paper bag that sounded like maracas every time I took a step, drugs dancing in my hand, vibrating, ready to dive into my mouth and bring some stability into my life. That night, I rolled the bottle in my hand and ringed off the lid, and a small white pill rolled off into my clammy hand. Okay, Trazodone, let's see what you can do. Holy shit. <laughs> I thought that the pills would feel like being gently cradled into the sleeping arms of a giant where blackness enveloped my consciousness and everything was muffled. I wasn't out like a light, I was a zombie. My eyes felt glued open while my brain was melting into a puddle of tar between my ears. I would giggle and walk around the house at night, bumping into walls and shoving food in my mouth. There were mornings when I would wake up and not remember what I did the night before, only to look at my YouTube history and find that I watched hours of cyber goths dancing to industrial music under bridges. <laughs> Another day, I woke up to my wallet in my hand and an emailed receipt for a $25 pair of booty shorts I bought. I wouldn't find out until a week later when I unfolded it in my hands that thick bitch was splashed across the ass. <laughs> they are still my favorite Trazodone outcome. Two weeks later, I walked into the, my psych's office and demanded to be taken off Trazodone. He knew what to give me. That's where the real pain began. His counter, clonopin. <laughs> Y'all know. <laughs> <laughs> it lasts twice as long as Xanax and is more intense. Taking clonopin is like taking a bath in warm caramel. Everything feels luxurious and creamy, except without the stickiness. One pill is enough for someone experiencing a panic attack or trying to sleep, but not for me. Neither was three, according to him. He eventually prescribed me six pills of Klonop in a night. I know. <laughs> Why? That many pills of Klonop is enough to knock out a horse, but I fought the effects. I didn't want to give up my sweet nocturnal peace. I stumbled through my days in a drugged stupor. 
I felt like a quarter stuck in a washing machine, drowning and pinging around in my own head, unable to quiet the noise and never seeming to find a way out. Because I apparently liked shitty situations, I continued to see that psychiatrist in order for him to fill out my insane prescriptions of clonopin. Clonies are a depressant that are incredibly addicting and often used to curb panic attacks, which I could use right now. You're only supposed to use them in very small amounts to help take the edge off. I ended up in an incredibly toxic, I also ended up in an incredibly toxic and abusive relationship with a person who was just as damaged as me. I was surrounded by a person whose own depression was constricting while I was already choking on my own. It was one thing after another, and no amount of clonopin was helping. I was being smothered from the inside by my relationship and clonopin like a black hole, enveloping itself until there was nothing left but dark matter. Finally, the day came when my depression caught up and I was scared for my own life. I cried on the phone to my parents that I was scared to be alone and was, a, and was afraid of what I would do. I called my boss and told her I wouldn't be coming in. My parents rushed me to an emergency meeting with my psychiatrist. He decided to add two more pills to the six I already took that night. You just need to sleep and you'll feel better, he said. The next day I decided to go with my boyfriend to my friend's home where they would jam and I would dye my friend's hair green. I decided to take all eight pills of clonopin so I'd be tired by the time I got home. I popped them into my mouth like a handful of small yellow M&Ms. Five minutes later I was slurring my words and slumping over. It was the first time I ever had that reaction. I was shoved into my boyfriend's car as my friend was helpless and scared while green dye oozed on his scalp. I faded in and out of consciousness on the drive home, long enough to say how much I wanted to marry my boyfriend, gross, and how I wanted to be happy, finally. I woke up the next morning in my bed, still in my clothes from the night before. I was unable to move. I was seized up, my muscles stiff like the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. I had overdosed on clonopin, and I spent the next week in bed barely able to move. Clonies is storing your muscles, and they take seemingly forever to leave your system. However, when you're as inundated with those pills as I was, you can't cut them out cold turkey. Not even warm turkey. You can have a seizure from withdrawal and even die. I felt sick to my stomach, but I still had to take at least four. I still needed them to survive. Shortly after, I went back to my psychiatrist, where I should have kicked the, down his door and spun kicked the fuck out of his face. For having, me made, for having made me dependent on clonopin. Yeah, this time we clap. <laughs> After all, what I had just wanted all along was to find peace, but instead found a fix that was a poor substitute from a doctor who shouldn't have been practicing in the first place. It ended up taking me eight months to chide trade off that many pills. I had to cut pills into quarters and felt like I wanted to vomit all the time while I was clammy from the cold sweat of withdrawal. It was hell, but I eventually broke free. It was important for me to get off of them because I realized I can't find peace within a pill bottle. Being smothered in a thick glare of nothing does not keep depression or anxiety at bay. It may quiet things temporarily, but those demons find a way to punch you in the emotional tit if you don't deal with them. <laughs> to this day, I prefer the dark. I still struggle with depression and anxiety, but they're not quite as noticeable. I've learned to live with them. I'm still a creature of the night. I struggle with the anxiety, but I no longer think about the plastic taste of clonopin on my tongue. I don't crave any drugs anymore, besides the whiff of the occasional Sharpie. I'm not sure if I'll ever find the peace I crave, if I will ever live, laugh, love without the help of a few small psychiatric pills that I pop into my mouth nightly. I don't know if there will ever be a time where everything changes and my anxiety dissipates and my depression finally drains from my body. I've survived an overdose and I survive mental illness daily. I do know that this will be a lifelong struggle for me, and that's okay. I'm okay. Or at least I think I am. Will I be okay? Yeah, that's the one. She'll see you in your dreams. That's Victoria Leva, everybody. We buried the octopus on a grassy hillside in North Carolina. His name was Javier. We named him Javier because he had dark eyes set beneath a broad forehead, which reminded us of Academy Award winning actor Javier Bardem. <laughs> Javier the octopus came into my life, and more specifically my college apartment, through a hasty phone call from my biology major roommate, Braden. 
dude, we need to get a fish tank today. And then when I asked the obvious why, yeah, a fish tank, a big one. I'm flying back from this internship at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute tonight. My buddy just finished an experiment on Okinawan octopodi. That's right, octopodi, not octopi. I know, that was my first time hearing the proper plural of octopus for the first time. Turns out octopodi is scientific Greek-derived Latin, and octopi is bullshit peasant Latin. <laughs> anyway, Braden continued. It turns out they breed like rabbits. He's got like a hundred more than he counted on, and he's got to get rid of the surplus fast. So yeah, we own an octopus now. My first question was if he planned to bring the octopus as a carry-on or as a checked baggage. Can't do that, he explained. The experiment was off the books. Okinawan octopodi are an invasive species. They're not supposed to be on U.S. soil, so we're smuggling them out. Listen, this guy is the size of a dime right now. I put him in a contact lens cleaner bottle and pumped in about three hours worth of oxygen with a syringe. At, at least I think it was three hours. I did the net math on a napkin. He's got just enough O2 content in the water to make it through the airport in a TSA-approved baggie if we time it up perfectly. But after my flight gets in, we need that tank. Braden had a lead on some excess equipment in the bio department, so I sourced the half cubic meter tank before his flight touched down. Barely three hours from when I picked up his call, Braden careened through the apartment door, dropped his bags, pulled out a Ziploc bag, unscrewed the contact lens vial, and out popped top gear. He was, as Braden said, about the size of a dime. He had mottled brown skin and nearly transparent tentacles covered in microscopic suckers. He had deep, dark Spanish eyes. <laughs> and he was not having any of our bullshit. Octopodi are smart. They are not pets, but wild animals. And they crave their natural environment. And because they are smart, they can quickly figure out two things. That they are not in their natural environment, and you are the malevolent being preventing them from living there. According to the Military Code of Conduct, service members are trained that the best chances of escape from enemy captivity are within the first hours of capture. Javier knew the code. <laughs> Poor captors that we were, we had the large fish tank and oxygenated water. We did not have a lid. Javier immediately employed his minuscule suckers and scaled the wall like a tiny gelatinous Spider-Man, launching himself from the top rim. He landed cat-like and scuttled along our beer-stained countertop, making a beeline for the kitchen sink drain. Maybe it was a primal calling. Maybe he had carefully observed the behavior of humans in the laboratory of his birth. Either way, he somehow knew that was the path to the ocean. We screamed low, manly screams, and raced around the island countertop to intercept his course. With many utterances of, oh fuck, grab him, grab him, and knocking over two or three whiskey bottles, Braden scooped him up at the last second and popped him back into the tank. We flattened a cardboard Amazon box and laid it atop the tank as a makeshift lid. We let out a sigh of relief. Javier stalked the tank like a boxer in his corner waiting for the bell. Braden went to the freezer and pulled out a bag of pre-cooked shrimp, an artifact of earlier ambitions to impress girlfriends with scampi and wine. As of that last semester, we neither of us had those girlfriends anymore, so the least we could do was welcome our new visitor with the, the finest leftovers. Braden turned and started to bring the headless shrimp back to the tank. Javier saw the decapitated creature and perhaps thought he was next, so he wasted no time. He proceeded to scale the inner wall of the tank, Superman punched a dime-sized corner of the cardboard aside and then hopped his way down the outside of the enclosure like an escaped convict, rappelling down the prison wall with a bedsheet. Braden dropped the shrimp, and we again scrambled to scoop him back into the tank. He followed it up with the recovered shrimp from the floor. Five-second rule. When the shrimp hit the water, Javier figured out the situation. Octopodi are, after all, fellow carnivores. As I watched the tiny octopus propel himself towards the shrimp and proceed to rip it to digestible shreds, I realized the affinity Braden must have felt for this creature. I remembered a gray Massachusetts afternoon five years before. I'd sat down at lunch with Braden, another lanky Irish kid like me at my high school, who just happened to be on his way to the same college. We both discovered we needed a roommate, 
and I watched in awe as he then inhaled six slices of Uno's deep dish pizza without chewing once. The octopus and the biologist had uncanny habits when it came to feeding frenzies. With Javier at least satiated, if not happy, we piled economics textbooks on the tank to fasten the cardboard lid in place. One problem solved. As the days went by, though, we had to face the truth that we were wholly under-equipped for this endeavor. Okinawa and Octopodi thrive in a specific pH and oxygen balance, which we tried ham-fistedly to achieve by frequently tweaking the pump on the fish tank. To this day, we aren't sure how often we got it right. We knew Javier needed intellectual stimulation, so into the tank went new objects and puzzles for him to manipulate. Coins, chapstick tubes, their caps half unscrewed, shrimp frozen in ice cubes, and seashells. He'd interact with each object, but only briefly, lazily, as if he were bored or dejected. His favorite item was an empty seashell, a bivalve, which he'd curl into to sleep. The toys didn't do too much for him, but maybe they helped build a tiny bit of trust. When Braden lifted the cardboard to feed him, he didn't attempt to escape. Sometimes he'd even swim cautiously up to his hand and raise a palm or hug a finger. Javier ate like crazy, but he didn't grow much. With his eight arms spread out, he might have spanned the width of a quarter that rested in the sand by his seashell house. Maybe this should have been a sign of his health. Adults of his species can wrap around the human hand, so this growth rate wasn't exactly on pace. Braden had figured on needing a bigger tank eventually, but as the days turned to weeks, that day never seemed to come. Javier was a novelty for sure. He helped us host rush parties and made appearances at low-key game nights over beers. He was our sounding board as we had navigated our final semester and warily kept an eye on real life approaching over the horizon. But between shrimp dinners and our desperate attempts to find new toys, we sensed our new roommate gradually withdrawing. After weeks of routine, swim, eat, sleep, repeat, his final journey outside of his tank came as a surprise. Braden went to feed him his usual lunch, shrimp bits on the rocks, and noticed that Javier hadn't emerged from his shell. Concerned, his former smuggler took the shell from the tank, tilting and gently rubbing a shrimp-stained finger over the valve to prompt the octopus to come out. No response. Minutes went by, and the inevitable conclusion took hold. Braden sighed, shoulders dropping, and took our little friend outside for a, a final goodbye. Beyond our sliding patio door, the wet North Carolina grass sloped gently upward from a storm drain. Cradling the shell in his palm for another moment, Braden decided it was as fitting a resting place as any for such a tiny creature. He gently laid the shell in the grass and began to scrape a trench in the wet clay earth. No sooner had his fingers left the shell, Javier came alive like an eight-armed Lazarus. He sprang from the shell and made a desperate break for the storm drain. <laughs> He was almost about to springboard from a blade of grass when Braden caught him. Back to the tank he went. Though we couldn't be heartless and take his shell. We didn't blame him. He was still a wild animal. And by now we knew we couldn't afford the perfect, sophisticated environment that he truly needed. We couldn't responsibly release him into the wild, nor could we return him to the lab of his birth, where he'd be unceremoniously killed as experimental refuse. We didn't, he, he didn't know this, of course. At the same time, we couldn't help but be a little hurt by his deception. <laughs> Hadn't there been like the glimmer of a bond? As winter turned to spring, life got busy. Braden had to travel every other week to apply for grad programs. I was wrapping up my finals and getting my life together to join the Marines. Both of us were throwing our possessions into boxes, donation bins, or the trash, and giving our furniture to underclassmen friends. Every day we'd throw shrimp to the octopus, but our performance as keepers dropped. Hey, did you check on Javier yesterday? Fuck, sorry, man. I fed him twice in the morning, but I've been on campus all night. Hey, I gotta head out of town. Can you take my day tomorrow? Wait, today was my day then? Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, I got it. One day in late spring, we both came up to Javier's tank, shrimp in hand, and looked down to see the faint layer of uneaten dinner bobbing on the surface. The soggy cardboard and warped books were in place, but Javier was nowhere to be seen. The seashell rocked almost imperceptibly in the tank's filter. Braden, having seen this maneuver before, removed the shell and cradled his palm. Minutes went by. We took him outside. We waited. We waited. We buried our octopus in his favorite shell. 
on a grassy hillside in North Carolina. To this day, we feel a pang of guilt for Javier's passing. At the moment, <laughs> I've, I've had years to process this, so I understand. <laughs> To this day, we feel a pang of guilt for Javier's passing. A at the moment, it was a punch to the gut. His status as a wild animal of questionable health aside, he was our responsibility. He was our companion as our chapter of college life came to a close. We had no plan for his life beyond the apartment, but we couldn't help but feel we let him down. We got some relief when we learned that our octopus's brief life might not have been unnatural after all. Perhaps it was even faded. Braden's research buddies in Cape Cod later revealed that out of Javier's dozens of siblings, only a few survived to adulthood, growing to about the size of a human hand. The Okinawan octopus has a massive litter of young, in anticipation that almost all will in fact die, especially because the strongest few will quickly achieve their growth spurts by feeding on their smaller, frail brothers and sisters as an available protein source. Javier's surviving family is a bunch of cannibals and cutthroats. <laughs> My guilt somewhat relieved, I still had one boundary I wouldn't cross. Years later, my girlfriend couldn't understand why I refused to eat fried calamari at restaurants. <laughs> I, I finally found the strength to open up to her about Javier. That's when she told me calamari is actually squid, not octopus. <laughs> so now I eat that stuff all the time. Uh, octopodi are intelligent and often mischievous, but squid are just douchebags. <laughs> They use flashes of bioluminescence to disorient their prey, then kill them with poison, but then they have these stupid little mouths, so they have to take dainty, pretentious, tiny bites of food that's way too big for them to eat without being wasteful, while radiating their skin through 16 different colors just to attract everyone else's attention and attract potential mates. They're the Instagram influencers of the sea. <laughs> but you know what? They're fucking delicious, fried up and sprinkled with lemon. It's six years later, and I'm living in Oceanside with my, when my closest friend and former roommate and newly minted doctor of microbiology calls me. Yeah. <laughs> the shores of San Diego sounded a lot better than lockdown in Boston, and once again, we both needed a roommate. As a master diver, Braden also knew that he had a lot better options here than in the North Atlantic during rainy season. He'd been hounding me for years to get my diver certification, but while I liked swimming, Something about the depths seemed inherently foreboding. My friend rocketed across the continent in a Jeep fueled by 7-Eleven coffee, and we caught up in my living room over beers. As always, we regressed to our college selves, just far less capable of drinking extensively. So instead of going out, we ended the night with a Netflix documentary. Somehow, we, we settled on my octopus teacher. <laughs> Some of you are ahead of me on this. For those who haven't seen it, a story of a South African diver who forms a relationship with a solitary octopus over the course of a year, documenting its life and eventual death through daily visits. I felt the ghost of Javier glide alongside us as I watched this octopus at the end of its life, sick, hungry, wounded from shark battles, retreat from the man it had come to know. It touched him one last time, then sank lower and deeper into its cave until one day it never came out. This intelligent, solitary creature, knowing it was dying, went off to do so on its own in dignity. Like a sick cat running off to the alleys after years indoors, an old Inuit hunter going out in the ice one last time during a famine, Javier in his shell. The credits rolled, and we said nothing. I finally broke the silence. Dude, you're right, I gotta get me a dive cert. <laughs> If Javier can venture out to our world, I can do the same for our lady little friend. Thank you. That was a man who said without irony he got his life together to join the Marine Corps. Mr. Ben Kent, everybody.
At the end of my junior year of college, my fiance of four years annihilated my world with five words. We should take a break. I wasn't exactly in the best shape coming out of that semester either. I had never felt comfortable in any of my classes. I suffered a severe case of imposter syndrome on my research internship. And I think collectively I got only like 20 minutes of sleep. I was tired, stressed, and anxious. I was usually pretty good at this whole school thing, but I wasn't on my A-game that year. But at least I had time with my long-distance fiancé to look forward to. Until that Skype call. I could tell something was off. She said she hadn't been attending many of her classes, which was worrying considering she was already on academic probation. That bomb was followed by, she'd been expelled. I knew she tied her identity to her academics, so I was Im immensely worried. I ran through possible solutions in my head, anything I could do to help her, which is when she told me we should take a break. There was a palpable silence. All I could eke out was confused, okay? I wanted to be supportive. She was going through a stressful time. I was scared. My hope that this was temporary didn't last long, though. She told me about a friend of hers and how she told him she liked him and planned to start dating pretty much as soon as the call was over. What really stuck with me was a comment she made right after. Pretty much, hey, maybe now you could ask out that girl at Barnes & Noble. Like, that's what I wanted to hear? After breaking off an engagement and soiling nine years of friendship, she thought the prospect of hitting up a girl who flirted with me once might make it all better? He was my best friend, someone I thought knew me more than I knew myself, and after finding out I'd been emotionally cheated on, she thought the thing on my mind was a rebound bookstore girl. I was dumbstruck. She must have picked up on it because she said she needed to get her marbles together over the summer, that we would get back together after. I was silent as she kept talking. Did this have to do with her getting expelled? She thought I would want to hear about the other guy and told me more about him. I would have checked out mentally when she slipped in that she was considering this summer to be her last as she had contemplated taking her life. She just said that, like it wasn't the most alarming thing. I made a huge deal out of it, but she brushed it off. Uh, by that point, I was an emotional wreck held together by forced positivity, concern, and duct tape. Holding my chin high, I nodded as she told me about her summer plans. She seemed happy. And as soon as the, as the call ended, I broke down and cried for an hour straight. I fell into a place I had never been before. I refused to leave my house. I put my internship on hold and got really into blues music. Two weeks after the call, I learned taking a break meant she was breaking up. All that talk about taking time and getting back together after the summer was like an ice cream. I was promised for getting a shot, but there was no ice cream. I should have realized what was happening, but in my defense, this was my first long-term relationship. I isolated myself with my post-breakup thoughts. The girl I loved with all my heart had been expelled from school and had contemplated suicide. She needed help. I desperately needed closure, so I did the most rational thing possible. I booked a flight to Illinois. She reacted like I told her the in-laws were coming. If her tepid response wasn't enough, I hate flying. Unfortunately, to get to Champaign-Urbana, I not only had to fly into Chicago, but I then had to take a tiny rickety plane the rest of the way. As soon as I sat down in the model plane, the ceiling started dripping on me. A good sign. Then I and, and I kid you not, a rabbi, a Jesuit priest, and an imam stepped onto the plane. <laughs> this sounds like the setup to a joke, but it wasn't funny when I was sitting there under a drippy ceiling, scared out of my mind. Then we hit a big patch of turbulence. The triad of religiosity started chanting and praying out loud, and I was convinced I was going to die on this flight of doom. I thought to myself, if I die, will she even care? The first moment of seeing her was awkward as awkward can be. I decided to hug her, but it turned into one of those weird side hug deals. After we awkwardly stood a platonic three feet apart while we waited for an Uber. Something had changed between us. 
We got to her place. I settled into the little Harry Potter closet room that I'd be borrowing while her roommate was out of town. My expectation was I was there to support her and help her get back on her feet. My hope was that I could save our relationship. Instead, every day she left me at her place for hours on end to go and hang out with the other guy, leaving me to spend a lot of time in that closet room. I was in a city I'd never been to before in my life. I knew no one there other than her. It wasn't like a fun vacation either. Champagne in the summer is one of the most miserable places I've ever been. Stepping outside was like that dream sequence in Terminator 2, as a wave of heat immediately enveloped me. And even if I was willing to bear the atomic heat, there was nowhere I wanted to go alone. I was lonelier than I had ever been wallowing at home. On the bright side, I got really good at solitaire. One night, she came into my little Harry Potter room and sat on my awful twin mattress. It seemed like she felt guilty about how she'd been treating me. For the first time since before that Skype call, I felt some genuine warmth and connection from her. We laid on the bed and talked about how I felt abandoned and she felt torn. We were getting close. and She said she was so confused about it all, and then I tried to kiss her. Immediately, she pulled back and sat up. Her body language completely changed. I messed up. It was dumb, it was thoughtless, and spurred on by a lot of emotions. I apologized profusely and tried to explain. Uh, she said she understood, but ultimately decided to go stay with the other guy for a couple of days. I spent two days in that air conditionless room, trapped with my thoughts and anxieties. Eventually, she came back and told me she wanted me to come to a 4th of July party. All of her friends were going to be there, including him. Naturally, I was hesitant about this idea. I guess she felt guilty about leaving me alone, and this was her way to get me out. My going to the party meant a lot to her. I loved her, so ultimately, I agreed to go. But on the walk there, I learned that most of her friends knew me only as an ex who made her cry. Despite my increased hesitancy, I journeyed into one of the most harrowing experiences of my life. I was surrounded by people who judged me before they even got to know me. Somehow, I managed to win them over by turning out to not be Satan. Um, the only person who was still not a huge fan of me was the other guy. After a few passive-aggressive inter interactions from him, I was ready to leave. She, however, wasn't. I couldn't leave by myself since she had the only key, and frankly, I wasn't comfortable with either of us walking alone on one of the top 10 party campuses in America at night on the 4th of July less than a month after a student had been kidnapped off the sidewalk. So I was stuck making uncomfortable party conversation with the other guy, hoping she would pick up on my obvious discomfort. I was left feeling completely alone. I no longer recognized the girl I grew up with, or the girl I was going to marry. Then it got worse. The next day, she decided the other guy and I should talk. Apparently he had feelings that needed to be expressed. So he... <laughs> So he came to her place, and we both awkwardly waited for her to come downstairs. I extended my hand to him as a gesture of friendliness, which was, which was when I realized how different we are. I didn't really get a good chance to look at him at the party, but now I saw I towered over the guy. I'm talking Gandalf and Frodo. I can only imagine he saw this like... <laughs> I can only imagine he saw this like David and Goliath, based on what was happening, happening next. We walked to a park near her place and sat down in the centermost gazebo. It was like a scene out of a soap opera. I was on one side of the bench with her and the other guy on the other. Now began the trial of Robert Lang. Mr. Frodo made it clear immediately. Things have to change. He sounded a little like Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight. He wanted to establish once and for all that he was her boyfriend and I was out of the picture. More than that, though, he wanted to deconstruct me, to show I was unfit to be her boyfriend. He boiled our entire relationship down to an old friendship. I didn't figure it out until later that she hadn't told him we were engaged. <laughs> to him, my psychology ma uh, major made me a skilled manipulator. A manipulator who came all the way to Devil's Anus, Illinois, just to mess with her. When I told him I wanted closure, he thought I was, ask I was asking for a polyamorous relationship. 
When I defended myself from his character assassination, he said I only talked about myself and never considered how she felt. That one upset me. Well, I think she should speak for herself, I said in response. We both turned towards her. She looked like a deer in the headlights and put her hands up without saying a word. He said, see, she doesn't have to say anything, which floored me, but if she didn't have anything to say, I had no argument. With a stern, condescending look on his face, he asked, you know what I see sitting in front of me? What? I knew damn well whatever he was about to say wasn't anything good. <laughs> I see a broken man. He steepled his fingers like a Bond villain. I was taken aback. I looked at her, hoping, almost praying she'd say something in my defense. Nine years of friendship, four years of love, hardship, vulnerability, discovery, and growth. I looked my best friend in the eyes, desperate and pleading, and she turned her gaze away from me. I turned back towards him, all hope gone from my eyes. I put my hands on the table, stood up, looming over him, and said, same here, pal. His eyes widened and he shrunk back a bit. I was done. He tried to paint me as selfish. She said nothing. He painted me as arrogant, still nothing. He had the nerve to say all that despite me being the only one who asked her to speak her own behalf. Of course, he brought up the kiss. Really fuming about that one, but didn't have much to say when I told him I was wrong to do that. She stepped away and left me alone with him. I somehow managed to completely defuse the raging hobbit. <laughs> by, the, <laughs> by the time she came back, all he had left was a list of pointless demands. He wanted me to move out of her place, which was going to happen that day anyway since her roommate was coming back. Check. He wanted me to allow her to spend a few days with him and their friends. Not exactly different than before. Double check. Both of these things were completely out of my power, but I said sure anyway. I bet it made him feel really good. Although I see her before leaving, watching her walk off hand in hand with the other guy was our final goodbye. I checked into a hotel for the remainder of my stay. I'd be damned if I rode on that hell plane ever again, so I decided to take a train back home. On that two-day trip back to San Diego, I began thinking about who I was. Was I the broken man the other guy saw? No. I came out to Champagne to help someone I cared about. I was a damn good friend who certainly wasn't perfect, but not broken. There's a saying I picked up in my studies that, thank you. There's a saving, uh, saying I picked up in my studies that has always stuck with me. Things are broken, not people. This guy, thank you. This guy knew me for less than a day and thought he had me all figured out. Meanwhile, the person who knew me for nine years had nothing to say. I don't resent her. On the contrary, I learned I should have more respect for myself. I shouldn't be happy being emotionally cheated on or sitting at an uncomfortable party to support someone who wouldn't even give me the courtesy of looking me in the eye as I was being dissected. As I returned home, I decided to do the most rational thing, and I closed that chapter of my life for good. Thank you. Robert Lang, everybody! I am not a woman of the sciences. My current relationship with science is limited to taking photos of things that wash up on shore and watching nature documentaries. Any real interest I may have had in science was thwarted early on by my high school biology class in 1984. I attended an all-girls Catholic high school run by the Sisters of St. Joseph. Their motto must have been, we promise academic excellence, but only if you're really smart. The nuns really didn't know how to work with struggling students. I excelled in anything literature or history-based and struggled with math and science. It didn't bother me that I wasn't doing well in those classes. I was a teen focused on fun with my friends, swatch watches, and sports. I only needed the math skills it took to know if I could afford the new Tears for Fears album at Tower Records. 
Biology was a sophomore year requirement. I was nervous, but looked forward to having friends in the class. We were all buzzing about our teacher, Miss Gammon. Up until that point, most of our teachers had been nuns. Nuns that were probably in their late 30s or 40s, but seemed ancient. They didn't wear habits, but their tight old lady perms, polyester skirts, and sensible shoes made them appear far older than they probably were. The few teachers who were not nuns seemed like they had flipped a coin between the nunnery or spinsterhood and landed somewhere in the middle. They wore sensible shoes as well and held the same uptight demeanor and strict rules as the nuns. But Miss Gammon, our biology teacher, was different. She was young. She had long, feathery hair, wore floral blouses and denim skirts. Above all, we were shocked that she had a tattoo. A tattoo! How on baby Jesus' earth did she get hired by the nuns? Did she hide her tattoo in the interview? Did she promise a few extra Hail Marys? In the 80s, the only people with tattoos were in the Navy, but Miss Gammon wasn't a sailor. She was more of a hippie. She wore high-heeled sandals that always showed off her ankle tattoo, which was a Pegasus. <laughs> Miss Gammon did not seem to follow the nun's method of teach to the smart girls, forget the rest. Within the few, first few weeks, I looked forward to class and somehow believed I was pretty good at biology. But as the semester wore on, the class grew harder and harder, and Miss Gammon didn't seem as free-spirited as she did at the beginning. We did an experiment where we tested our own blood to see what type we were. Many students were grossed out by pricking their own fingers and squirting some blood on the sample pad. Others, like my friend Georgette, took delight in it. I've never been squeamish about blood, so I felt I could be fairly successful. Miss Gammon went around the room and asked students their blood type. When she got to me, I said, AB negative. She stared at me. No. Um, I repeated my AB negative answer, to which she replied, that's impossible. Less than 1% of the population has AB negative. You must have done something wrong. I pricked my finger again and retested. Still AB negative. I quickly turned in my lab sheet, which was returned the next day. My AB negative earned me a C minus. <laughs> Our last big lab activity of the semester was the dissection lab. We started off simply with grasshoppers before moving on to more complex specimens. The grasshoppers were basic. It was like pulling twigs apart and barely felt like it had once been a living being. At lunch after the lab, Georgette pulled what was left of the grasshopper out of her pocket. George, as we called her, waved the grasshopper around in people's faces, eliciting shrieks and squeals from our friends. George was our wild child. She was smart, crazy, hyperactive, and totally unpredictable. George was good at leading, but not always in the best direction. And I was a natural born follower. <laughs> George and I hung out a lot. Want to go to that sketchy pool hall? Sure, I would go. Let's pick up that hitchhiker. Um, okay. After school, let's cruise down to TJ for margaritas. Why not? George was in your face. Well, I usually flew under the radar. These were things I would only do with George because she could get away with it. It broke me of my rule follower persona, and I liked it. Despite our off-campus shenanigans, I was still a rule follower at school, and George's antics at school often made me nervous. I just wanted to get decent grades and stay out of trouble. The final dissection would count for a lot of our grade. It was a fetal pig. I knew I had to take this seriously. Ms. Gammon tried to prepare us for the dissection, describing all the scalpels and instruments we had in front of us. We were all pretty grossed out from the start. The classroom smelled of formaldehyde. We were sent to the refrigerator to pick a piglet. Wrapped tightly in the bag with solution, the pigs looked like filmy, slick footballs. Pigskins. 
There were lots of gasps and groans as we all unwrapped our specimens. Miss Gammon tried to quiet the class, quiet class, <laughs> and keep some control. The only audible sounds came from George. She let out her maniacal laugh periodically. Did her laughter mask her feelings? Was she nervous or excited? We placed our rubbery victims on the dissection pans and got ready for the first cut. Lab partners were fighting over who would have to make the incision. My partner held the little pig's legs out to the sides as I swept the blade lightly through the belly. While it cut pretty easily, the feel, the texture of the flesh was nauseating. Across the classroom, partners paused, taking deep breaths as the mood turned serious. It was as if we were the ones murdering Porky and friends. <laughs> Perhaps the most unpleasant aspect of the dissection was how long we spent on the pig. It wasn't a cadaver, and this was an anatomy class, but somehow we managed to spend two weeks cutting up the porkers. Our used residential grade refrigerator didn't seem to preserve the specimens as well as it should, and each day the smells intensified as our piglets turned grayer. My interest waned and became as dull and lifeless as my piglet. I plugged along, though. I can do this, I would tell myself. I just need to get a decent grade. George seemed rattled by the dissection. In class, after class, at lunch, for days, George would bring up the pig, talking about it as if it was still living. Oh man, this guy doesn't deserve this. He's screwed. <laughs> she was pretty obsessed, and those of us who knew her well began to worry. George was never one for just talk. She was one for action. And by action, I mean trouble. During the fortnight of fetal pigs, whispers began among our friends. Do you think George is acting weird? She's planning something, I can tell. Everyone was afraid to ask her what was going on. The thing about George was, she lived in her own head. She wouldn't tell you her feelings or thoughts. That was part of the attraction of being around her. Things would just erupt or spew out of her unpredictably. But each day as we entered biology, we wondered if George was all right. And then it happened. One day as we were cleaning up and returning our pigs to the fridge, George took her pig, stood by the open classroom window, and before Miss Gammon or anyone could react, tossed it out the window. As she released the fetal football, she yelled, Fly, pig, be free! <laughs> the pig fell from our second story to the courtyard below, landing with a sloshy splat. A brief silence filled the room, followed by the bell ending the class period. We ran out as Miss Gammon stared out the window. A group of students passing to their next period had already encircled the pig's remains. As we rushed out of the building, we could hear the story already being told to the confused onlookers. George looked out the window, laughed, and then disappeared. Soon the legend of George and her pig spread across campus. She's trying to get kicked out so her parents will have to send her to public school. Isn't she a vegetarian? I think she did it because she's a vegetarian. <laughs> Those of us in the class were bombarded with questions. I didn't want to talk about it too much. The sight of the splattered pig was worse than any part of the actual dissection. Other friends thought I had inside information, that I knew it was coming. I didn't, and I wouldn't have gone along with it if I had. Suddenly, I was worried that guilt by association might send me to the principal's office. Our afternoon shenanigans were fun, but rule follower me was terrified of getting in trouble at school. For all the fun we had off campus, I knew I wanted no part of this. Everyone asked why George did it. No one really knew. When questioned by classmates about the incident, George would just smile and say, yeah, it was rad. <laughs> we muddled through what was left of the semester. I managed an average grade. George left our school the following year. Surprisingly, she didn't get kicked out, but was encouraged 
to pursue her education elsewhere. While we stayed friends for many years, we definitely weren't as close. Maybe there were only so many trips to TJ we could get away with. And maybe I'd hit my limit for risky adventures. George kept going, skirting the line of danger and trouble, but always escaping somehow. She majored in parks and recreation while I studied English. I was never destined to be a scientist, just as I was never cut out to be a George. I'm just a person who prefers her pig on a dinner plate rather than one that flies. That is who I'm going to think about when I watch Babe in the City later tonight. Kate McGovern, everybody. Woo! All right. Kate, close out the show for us. Before I let you all go, um, thank you to our volunteers, Brent, Adam, Killian, and Chris, for your help tonight. And our amazing... And our amazing writing and performance coaches who would, we would not be here today without all of your immense help for performers. David, Brandy, Eileen, Jen, Dustin, Brent, Kelly, Jen, and Betsy. And of course, thank you to our amazing performers for sharing their stories with us and giving our heart and souls out tonight. Aber, Danielle, Victoria, Ben, Kate, and Michelle, give them a round of applause. <laughs> thank you and good night. Stay and have another drink and enjoy the rest of your evening. We'll see you next time.